Welcome back to College Conversations. I'm Dr. Fedor, and I help you navigate college. Today, I have with me a special guest. His name is Larry Boyer. He's the author of The Robot in the Next Cubicle, What You Need to Know to Adapt and Succeed in the Automation Age. Larry, that freaks me out just saying that. I think I'm going to be working with a bunch of robots next year, um, but here goes. Larry is also the founder and president of Success Rockets and New Horizons Advisors. He is also a speaker and consultant, helping everyone from high school students to business executives understand the nature of the fourth industrial revolution and the disruption it causes to both business and people. Larry, I hope we're gonna figure that out today because I feel very disrupted. In addition to speaking, Larry leads workshops and strategy sessions to help businesses position themselves for long-term success. Larry also coaches employees at all levels to plan and achieve long-term success in all aspects of their career and life. Larry, you are a busy guy. Thanks again for joining me. Um, Larry is also a certified business economist and a certified coach. So welcome, welcome. Um, Please remember to hit share if you found this um, helpful at the end and Uh, hit the subscribe button so I can continue to bring you these helpful videos and continue talking to people like Larry, who's going to figure it all out for us. So Larry, throwing it out there, what do you mean by the fourth industrial revolution? Because I'm getting a little scared here. Sure. So it's important to understand, first of all, just what an industrial revolution is, because we haven't had all, all that many of them. And it's different from just technological evolution, right? Because we have technology evolving all the time, right? Even if you just think about something like a smartphone that you've had and how the phone has evolved, right? That's just a simple evolution. So what makes a revolution different than than just new technology coming online? And it's a couple of things. So one, it's a whole bunch of new technologies coming together all at once. It's not and and combining so that's part of it right so it's not just one new technology and it's there it's five or six or ten or hundreds of new technologies all coming online and then working together and combining to create something new and working together Uh, so that's part of it another part of it is there's usually other things that are are happening at the same time uh, both politically socially um, as well as business processes and they're all all changing so an example of just a business process changing um, is mass production, right? That happened in the second industrial revolution, right? So it's not that there was any new technologies, you know, there were things going on that were all part of what had existed before, but now we're doing things different as a result of those new technologies. The first industrial revolution had the steam engine, right? You can invent the steam engine. That doesn't mean that anything is is changing but now we have new means of transportation for example right in the steamboats and trains and that transforms the way that we do business the way that people in society live um, right here in the united states that opened up the west right when we suddenly had steam engines and um, and trains right the population could move west far easier than it had before you know for example with covered wagons right it was a much harder trip before so that changed the way and the very nature of society. So the same thing is happening now, and we're just in the earliest stages of it with the fourth industrial revolution. We see all kinds of new technologies, whether it's, um, you know, we see a little bit of the things like the internet and social media are parts of it, but we also have blockchain technologies that are new, artificial intelligence, uh, breakthroughs in medical technology and health technology. all of these things coming together to produce something new that hasn't existed before. And we still can't even imagine where all of it's going to go quite yet. I thought of a couple things while you were explaining all of that. And one is about sustainable energy. What (laughs) role do you think sustainable energy is playing in this fourth industrial revolution? As far as like, is that um that it that will completely you know change some industries and so forth but is that similar to you know another industrial revolution so sustainable sure. energy sure that, and that that very well could be part of it right so we're in the early parts of that right now so it's hard right. to say what exactly sustainable energy will be in the long term um and how that will evolve but people are interested in it they're working on it and that's what makes it possible right and so whether that's solar or wind uh it could be batteries 
Um, the fact is, is that people are working on all of these, right? We don't know what the winner is going to be, but right. what we do know is, is that things are going to change, right? 10 or 15 years from now, we'll have a clear picture of that, right? But I think what's, what's important to realize right now is that kind of a disruption is going to happen. And the question is, is right, which is going to be the, the winner? So anybody who's not working in sustainable energy, you know, that's an area where you're likely to see some, some sort of disruption. Right. Anybody who's working in sustainable energy, that's potentially a, a high growth area. Um, but which one will win? Can't, can't really say that at this point. So how should students prepare for their future, knowing that um, we're in the middle of a fourth industrial revolution, or maybe you would say we're at the beginning of the mm -hmm. fourth industrial revolution, you know, mm -hmm. just sort of like in a historical sense. And it's not often that you stop and say, wait a minute, where am I in the whole, <laughs> you know, scheme of things? But I think just even in the last two decades, we can say, where were we with cell phones you know 20 years ago where not everyone had a cell phone and if you did it at most made a phone call and took pictures and now it seems like virtually everyone has a smartphone that you can you know do almost everything with so just in the short time frame of two decades that technology has changed a lot right you and i grew up with landlines and we were lucky yep. that there was you know one phone and maybe you had an extension you know in, in the bedroom but the main phone was in the kitchen and yep. um, so so things have just changed dramatically with that. So how should students prepare for this and what should they be keeping in mind? Yeah, so I think, you know, there's a couple of things. One thing to realize is just historically, industrial revolutions have lasted about 40 years. Oh, 40 years. OK. Yeah. And so for, for their entire life. So essentially, you can expect probably your entire work life will be taking place in this industrial revolution with lots of disruption before yeah. there is any kind of stability. Um, you know, we like to say right now, right, change is the only constant. Well, that's because we're in the middle of this industrial revolution where there is lots and lots of, of change. Eventually that will stabilize for a little while until there's something else new to, to come along, right? But right, it'll have to be stabilized at some point just because all of these new technologies will have to start fitting together and that will be what stabilizes, right? Because people will be figuring out how to put these new technologies together. So as a student, recognize, you know, disruption is going to be part of this. You're going to have to be evolving and learning all of the, all of the time. Um, I think one of the keys for long-term success for anybody from a personal development standpoint is to understand yourself and what you are good at and what makes you unique and special and, and your value add to it. Right. The key is not to attach yourself to any particular technology because that can change, that will get disrupted. Um, that's happened throughout all of our, our work lives now. Right? What was a popular technology even 10 years ago is non-existent today. And so we tend to want to gravitate and define ourselves as a particular type of, um, you know, having a particular type of knowledge um, but that is always going to change, right? And whether you're talking about, you know, well, you know, I'm a, a Fortran programmer or then right. I'm now a, a C++ programmer and now I'm an Ethereum programmer, right? Mm -hmm. All of those things change and evolve and you're going to have to learn, you know, not to identify yourself specifically as that, but, you know, really how is it that you're going to add value? These other things on the outside, they're outside of you and they're the tools that you use, right? And so if you think of yourself, in some ways, you have know, like a carpenter, right? You have tools. Carpenters right. build things, right? My value is, is I can build and fix something. And that's what you want to be thinking about yourself is, is what do you build? What do you fix for, for people? And, you know, you can have a different set of tools that is always changing and evolving over time. I think that's the mindset that, that people have to start thinking about. So it's more of a mindset. And I feel like that's something that colleges should be preparing students and graduates for. You know, this is really the reality. This is the mindset you should have. That's one of the reasons why I use keep learning as my tagline, mm -hmm. because I feel like the minute you say, oh, I'm all done with school. You know, I it bothers me when students graduate and they say, now I'll never have to worry about school again for the rest of my life. I'll, I'll, right. you know, and it's like, that's so not true. You and I both know that it, it's like, you know, 
you can never say, well, I'm done learning because what happens? You get a job and then what do you immediately do? You go through their training program and they teach you the, you know, company ABC way of doing things or, or whatever. Yeah. Um, another thing I was thinking about is how how can schools um, how can schools react to this as far as like, you know, preparing students for this? Because I feel like it's not so much a specific skill, but learning how to be adaptable and mm -hmm. how to be creative and a problem solver, because it seems like, like you, you mentioned some software programs and, you know, you learn how to do something, you graduate, you get a job and we don't even do that anymore because six months ago, everything, everything changed. Um, can you comment on how schools can maybe teach that or what should they be doing to, how should schools change knowing this? How should schools change? I guess is my question. Yeah. So I think you know, part, part of it again is, is teaching that mindset and that mindset change and it's getting beyond being the, the superficial part not only about skills but even thinking about mindset and just saying it's, it's always about change and always about learning right because people hear that all the time right but we don't really necessarily understand well what does that exactly mean and you know perhaps something you know where we start looking at examples about what this means for people in their careers and in, in different ways um, and, you know, and this is probably a great thing for your, your program here right, is exploring what has this meant for people in their lives over time, right? Because we can learn from each other. And I think that's really what the this key skill is here right? is seeing examples of it. And what does it mean in real life? Because it's very easy to just think about, well, there's some magic recipe for it. And then that's the end of it. Um, and it's, it's not really a recipe, right? I mean, we can talk about all of these things, but if we're not really working on it we're not really observing it um, we're not really going to get it right because we have to really internalize it and make it a part of our being and, and who we are and as long as we think there is just some little recipe or some little syllabus that you can create on it that's not going to get you where you ultimately need to be right that, that can help you raise your awareness about the issues that you need to but really you have to internalize it and make it a way of, of being um, and, you know, and one way schools can do this, too, is through project work you know, and, and looking at and building projects. And I think, you know, the part of what schools do, I think that's that's good now. And they're looking to do more of right? partnering with businesses and, uh, you know, the internships and even pro school projects themselves. Right. Where you're working together and doing problem solving. Right. That's the, the skill. Um, and then facilitating learning the tools that you need to, right? So you don't necessarily think, oh, well, I'm gonna go and take a class exactly in programming or accounting or whatever, right? Those are the tools I need to do whatever it is that I want. So I need to learn those a little bit, but how am I going to apply those? How am I gonna add value with it? Um, and I and I do see that a lot. Uh, my last speaker actually last week was about, um, was from Capsim and about, how there's um, simulations to teach business acumen, mm -hmm. because you know we're we're talking about you know how do you teach problem solving skills and and being creative and teamwork and um, empathy and and a lot of those soft skills now that every employer will say we want to hire you know students or, or graduates with good communication skills who know how to be organized and work in a group and get things done and and, and all these things. So I feel like the um, this is a shout out for Capsim, I suppose. Um, that those business simulation um, sim, uh, business simulation programs, they actually give students that experience. You know, they're in a made up company, but they're still having to work together and like react to different things. And, you know, I yes. know it's all made up, but it's like, how else do you get the experience? And that's, you know, that's one of those things. Um, so, yeah. So the, the soft skills that, that we talked about, um, that's, you know, that that's kind of being woven into all of the, the business, um, the business uh, curriculum. Yeah, you know, I, th I think simulations are uh, are a good place for that as well. And you know, having gone through a lot of business trainings myself, even just these little online ones, um, again, they're usually kind of superficial. Yeah. yeah. But but people, I think, they're evolving, but they still have good points that they try to make in them, especially when you're looking at interpersonal reactions or things that. Uh, might be discriminatory, for example, and people don't often think about it, right? And so when you start looking at these things in real situations, and again, you layer new technologies on top of it, like right. with virtual reality, right? So people can now be in a more realistic situation than just looking at a flat screen and say, oh, okay, well, the obvious answer is, you know, you don't do that. 
what happens when you get into these places where there are gray areas um, and you don't necessarily know what is right or wrong or what's the right thing to say, and then you can get feedback from, you know, whatever, you know, and maybe it's an AI, right, who's responding to you in, in real time based off of training with other people who've, you know, responded to certain situations. Um, no, I, I do think realistic. that there's, there's, sorry, that real value in the simulations because one of the things I see students' presentation skills improve because each week they have to give a presentation and that's something where, you know, by the end, you know, they've given so many presentations that when they get a job and do it in real life, they're more comfortable with that. Yep. And with making mistakes with the simulation, it's like, okay, well, okay, that was just a class. It was just a simulation. You know, this is fake money. You lost a million dollars, you know, no big. It's a, you know, it's a simulation where, you know, that's not going to happen, you know, um, mm -hmm. in, the, in the real world. So, um, no, I think there's, you know, a lot of value with that. Yeah. And I think the key with that is going back and doing the analysis and saying, okay, what do we learn from that? Right. By making the mistake. And I think that that's one of the things I think where schools don't often come back to, right. You know, cause you get graded and it's all about being right or wrong. Right. But you know, when we come back and think about, okay, well that didn't work. Why didn't it work? What was right. the misunderstanding? Um, that's the real learning that, that needs to take place. And that's, what's important in business. Um, and, and people just need to understand, right? It's okay to take chances. It's okay to make a mistake. Um, the question is, what are you going to do to fix it? Right. Uh, and and what and do the analysis and what did we learn from this and and mm -hmm. so forth. And and really, that's that's the mark of a good supervisor, good boss, mm -hmm. is when the employees can take chances to a degree and learn from that and and move on. Yep. So, Larry, thank you again for joining me today. I look forward to our future conversations. Uh, please remember to share if you found this helpful and hit the subscribe button. And remember to keep learning.